You've probably seen them. On long trips, they dot the road. They are almost omnipresent at rest stops. They implore you to pull off the highway and take a look. In cities and towns, they mark old buildings and historic sites and even battlefields. There are hundreds of thousands of historic markers all around the world, large signs that usually give you just a little bit of information about historic events and people. And the history of such markers is probably both more ancient and more recent than you might have imagined. So whether you're one of those people who make it a point to search out and read each and every one, or one of those people who simply take them for granted, those markers represent the work of many people who believe in an important maxim that history deserves to be remembered. You can find historic markers across the United States, and they are present in many other countries as well, from Croatia and Iceland to the Philippines and Dominican Republic. They can come in many shapes and sizes, from the large roadside markers to more detailed ones at historic sites, all containing brief bits of historical information. This year, April 29th, is National Historic Marker Day in the U.S., which is held annually on the last Friday of April. The day was created by Syracuse, New York-based nonprofit William G. Pomeroy Foundation, which has funded 1,700 historic markers across the country. National Historic Marker Day encourages communities to take some time to clean and maintain some of the more than 150,000 markers across the United States. Perhaps the earliest version of historic markers belong to some of the most ancient societies in the form of stelae. In general, a stelae is a tall stone or wooden slab memorializing events, often erected as monuments across the ancient world. Many stelae include text memorializing an event occurring near where the stelae was erected, especially to commemorate military victories, although they also marked sacred territories and mortgaged properties. They were widely used by cultures around the world, including Mesopotamian civilizations, Greece, Egypt, Somalia, Eritrea, Ethiopia, in China and the Far Eastern cultures, and also by Mesoamerican cultures like the Maya and the Olmec. The famous Rosetta Stone is an example of a stele, but even more ancient ones exist commemorating battles and victories of kings like Neo-Assyrian King tiglath Pleser III. They even date back beyond writing in many cultures, with versions lacking inscriptions present in megalithic cultures in places like Libya and Scotland. Egyptian stelae date back as far as the 30th century BC. Stelae, such as the one in Copan, a Maya city, describe its history of dynasties, and a primary copy of the early legal text of the Code of Hammurabi comes from a stelae. More modern versions begin to appear in the Middle Ages. The Benin Empire, which should not be confused with modern Benin as the two do not share a historical relation, was one of the oldest and most developed states in the coastal hinterland of West Africa. The kingdom is known for thousands of brass plaques and sculptures, especially the ones that decorated the royal palace made since the 13th century. Located in modern Nigeria, the Benin bronzes represent some of the best examples of lost wax casting and have largely been looted by European interests following the European conquest of the region in the British Benin expedition in 1897. Included among the many examples of copper alloy art are plaques that commemorate important battles and historical figures. However, the artwork lacks any written descriptions to give them historical context. In Europe, similar brass plaques were used as funerary art to memorialize the dead. Beginning in the 13th century, the plaques began to replace wood and stone effigies. Many of these memorials depict important figures or events, and like modern historic markers, include brief inscriptions about the figure that provide some context to the plaque. Modern historic markers, however, don't appear until the 19th century. The first scheme in the modern era was presented in England in the House of Commons by William Ewart in 1863. It wasn't until 1866 that the Society of Arts implemented the concept, placing two plaques in 1867. Circular and handmade by a pottery firm, they commemorate important historical locations. The first was installed in Cavendish Square at 24 Holly Street in 1867, marking the birthplace of the poet Lord Byron. The house was demolished in 1889, making another plaque placed in 1867 to Napoleon III, the earliest to survive. The Society of Arts put up 35 plaques in 35 years, though less than half of those survive. In 1901, the London City Council took over the placement of the plaques, and in 1921, the color blue was made standard as it was thought to stand out best. The plaques were sometimes circular and sometimes rectangular, and over the years were made of different materials and colors. The modern design was created by an unknown student who was paid four guineas in 1938. Since 1965, the markers have been managed by the Greater London Council and English Heritage. The plaques are 19 and a half inches in diameter. 
The history of markers is also deeply entwined with preservation. The U.S. began acts of historical preservation in 1889 when Congress authorized the president to reserve land in Arizona containing the Casa Grande ruin. The country began establishing parks at major battlefields, established the Antiquities Act in 1906, which authorized the president to reserve national monuments. In 1916, the government established the National Park Service with the duty to conserve the scenery and natural historical objects and wildlife within parks and to provide for the enjoyment of the same. FDR broadened the Park Service's duties when management of American Civil War sites was transferred from the War Department. The Park Service first issued bronze plaques for important sites in 1960. In the United States, most of the earliest markers began appearing in the 20th century, but some predated those programs. Ezra Meeker, who traveled along the Oregon Trail in the 1850s, started a campaign to place markers along the trail in 1906, and by 1908 had helped erect 150 monuments. Wyoming appropriated $2,500 for markers on the trail thanks to a bill supported by the Daughters of the American Revolution in 1913. In 1913, Pennsylvania created the Pennsylvania Historical Commission, which had the power to mark by proper monuments, tablets or markers, places or buildings where historical events have transpired. In 1915, the Texas Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution spearheaded a project to mark the historic route of the King's Highway, also known as Camino Reale or the Old San Antonio Road. First, the road was marked with oak posts. In 1918, the posts were replaced with pink granite markers. In Michigan, a 1917 law allowed counties to appropriate funds for the purpose of marking historical places in their respective counties in commemoration of notable events. Many local governments, such as cities and counties and historic societies, notably the Daughters of the American Revolution, established other markers throughout the country in the early 1900s. Official state-funded programs didn't begin until later. In 1926, New York started a historic marker program in honor of the sesquicentennial of the American Revolution. Between 1926 and 1939, when the program lost public funding, they put up 2,800 markers. In 1927, Virginia began putting up markers as well, after William Carson of the Virginia Conservation Commission and campaign manager of then-Governor Harry Floyd Byrd established a marker system the year before in order to provide funds for advertising the advantages and resources of the state to a growing traveling public. The traveling public Virginia talked about was the growing number of people who owned cars. Car ownership exploded in the 1920s and 30s, allowing families for the first time to travel long distances with relative ease. Roads remained a problem as they were largely built and improved locally, but New Deal programs in the 1930s provided funds to improve roads across the country, further establishing a tourism industry in the country. In some states, such as Indiana, the Works Progress Administration provided funds to install historic markers and create jobs. The Virginia Conservation Commission's Division of History and Archaeology, headed by Dr. Hamilton J. Eckenrode, was tasked with running the program, including to determine the location of all markers and their inscriptions. Eckenrode insisted on a policy of installing markers based only on source documents and objective measures. Eckenrode's policies and efforts would help to popularize the concept of historic markers, as increased tourism and raised the historical consciousness of both the Commonwealth and the greater United States forming Virginia as the historical pivot point in the national narrative. Econode also wrote tourist literature and maps, which were introduced as cars became faster to help the interested locate particular markers that they might miss as they sped by. Throughout the 1930s and 40s, many states started official marker programs to commemorate historical events and locations. New York and Virginia were among the earliest, as were Colorado and Wyoming, who established programs in the 1920s and the 30s, and 40s saw many more states join the game, such as West Virginia, the Carolinas, New Mexico, Delaware, and more. By the 1960s, most states had established some kind of marker program, while competing for the enormous number of tourists unleashed after World War II. In 1954, 49 million Americans set out on heritage tours. Despite state programs and markers, urban renewal and growth was taking a toll on many historic locations. The Historic American Buildings Survey documented over 12,000 historic buildings since 1933. By 1966, half of them were either destroyed or damaged beyond repair. One significant example was New York's Pennsylvania Station, a Beaux-Arts-style building by McKim, Mead, and White, demolished in the 60s despite a fight to save it. In 1966, the U.S. established the National Historic Preservation Act, which codified a process to identify and incentivize the preservation of historical sites. In addition to creating federal programs like the National Register of Historic Places, it also required states to establish historic preservation offices. Most countries around the world have established national heritage agencies that identify, protect, restore, and mark sites important to the nation's culture and historic heritage. 
Emperor Franz Joseph I of the Austro-Hungarian Empire established the Federal Monuments Office in 1853, which had a number of departments dedicated to Austrian heritage sites. In Canada, the Historical Sites and Monuments Board of Canada began commemorating sites with bronze plaques in 1919, and the Chilean National Monuments Council has declared monuments in the country since 1925. During the French Revolution, France created a commission of monuments in 1790, although it wasn't until 1819 that a budget was established for historical monuments. In 1837, the Commission for Historical Monuments was established, and it published the first list of French monuments in 1840, and in 1887 a law was passed for the conservation of historic monuments. Since 1933, the Philippines has installed cast iron plaques to commemorate historic sites and events through the Philippine Historical Research and Markers Committee and its modern equivalent, the National Historic Commission of the Philippines. Similar programs exist in most countries, and many of them install plaques and markers at historic sites. Of course, these programs have not been without their criticisms. In 1988, a study of the 1,170 markers in Tennessee showed that only 0.7% of markers dealt with black history and 0.8% to white women. In fact, there were more markers, a full 0.9% dedicated to Davy Crockett. The early Virginia markers made no mention at all of black history, and naturally many histories were simply unrepresented, leading to questions regarding just how fully the past is remembered by these markers. Others have been criticized for providing little context or even commemorating unimportant events. Short descriptions can, of course, offer only a small amount of history. Historian Robin Winks, in a 1992 essay in The Public Historian Journal, wrote that markers do not record where history happened, they just tell us where history died. Yet others have been criticized for being inaccurate or omitting relevant information. Since they began as a means of improving tourism, they also often gloss over negative information. Many programs, from nonprofits like the William G. Pomeroy Foundation to state, county, and municipal governments, have sought to remedy this by establishing programs seeking to recognize minorities' contributions to history and to correct and replace other markers. The Pomeroy Foundation has also partnered with a number of states, including Iowa, Missouri, Ohio, Illinois, and Wisconsin, to fund new and replacement markers. From ancient stele to modern roadside markers, one thing the history of historic markers proves is how widespread the desire is to remember, to teach, and to preserve history. A need that seems to go across time, across cultures, across geography. It is easy for us to glance at these signs and then look away, forgetting that not only is the information they present important, but that even the signs themselves connect us to a deeper history a deeply human desire to tell the stories that have come before us. Every one of these signs represents someone's understanding that history deserves to be remembered. This year, April 29th, is your opportunity to contribute both to your local history and the history of these markers by organizing an effort to locate and clean historic markers in your area that could use a little extra care. The William G. Pomeroy Foundation even has a handy guide on how to clean a historic marker. The link is in the description. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.